Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's session. We are waiting for another five minutes so that others can join and then we will start our today's session. Today's session is a very high yielding session. We're going to discuss some of the very, very important sample questions today. And I hope the class will be important for those who are going for the exam in November and also those who are starting your preparation but don't know how the questions can appear in the exam. Thank you so much for joining today's session. All right, so let's just wait for five more minutes and then we are going to start. Thank you so much for waiting. All right, doctors, thank you so much again for waiting for our session to start. So let's start our question discussion today. Now, 
any of the question discussion, it's a very high yielding for the exam. It helps you to understand that how to find the tricks and traps of the questions. Now, this is not necessarily like the questions that will come in the exam, but this will give you an idea about like how questions can appear in the exam. And this experience is mandatory for anyone who is preparing for ANC MCQ. So we're going to do some of the recent sample questions to see that how it can come and how you guys can solve those questions. Now, solving a question doesn't mean that you memorize the answer of that particular question. It means that you go in detail of that theory. So the rule for any of the questions, when you get those questions, or when you, like, let's say that you are in a group and there are lots of MCQ are solving in that group and how you should prepare for that. You should not just go into the question answer, you need to go into the detail of your particular topics. So search the important websites related to that questions, go into the detail, mainly for any, any theories, what you need to do is to go to the, what's the signs and symptoms of that particular question and how we can investigate that particular disease, mainly what is the initial investigation and what is the most appropriate investigation that we need to find out. In AMC examination, as you understand that this is a highly sophisticated exam and the, they ask questions in a very, very particular way. And you need to understand that what question is asking. Sometimes you even know the exact answer of the questions, but you can, like, you can, you may not get the questions and then you can get the answer wrong. So you need to know that what exactly question is asking from you. So sometimes they can ask to you that what is the next appropriate investigation or what is the next most appropriate investigation. Anytime in the question there is next it means you need to do the most initial investigation, not the definitive investigation. If they ask that what is the best investigation to diagnose this condition, then obviously that will be the confirmatory investigation. If they ask what is the most appropriate investigation, then again the definitive investigation. If they ask that how you can diagnose this condition, that's also most appropriate question. So you need to understand that. Sometimes it can be easier. They can say that, what is your initial investigation? Then, then it's okay. If they ask, what is your next most appropriate management? Management includes both investigation as well as your treatment. So don't just say that they asked in the question, what is the next most appropriate management? And then you just choose some of the drugs or some of the definitive treatment. No, management includes both investigation as well as the treatment. It depends that which one should come first. Like if it's a meningitis case, like a meningococcal meningitis case, then what, which one should come first, your investigation or your treatment? Again, it depends that what is the scene, what is the scenario, what is the condition of the child? So in, in that particular case, you want to take a blood culture first, followed by starting the antibiotics wherever you get the patient. Like if, it is, if it's in the GP setting, you try to take the blood culture and then start IV antibiotic first dose immediately. If you cannot get the blood culture, then, and patient is very sick, so give the antibiotics first, send the patient to the hospital. So it depends on the total scenario. If they ask you the management, it includes both investigation and treatment. So these are the basic thing you should understand before you go for any question solving or anything. Okay, now let's move into those. Some of these questions may not be totally full questions or some of these, um, the questions that you will get here may not be totally complete. So it might be a little difficult to solve those things but obviously we will go into detail that how it can be totally complete questions. And if these uh, questions, sometimes what they do that they can add some extra line or they can change the whole questions. 
all right so you should always always read the questions properly you should need you should always try to find out that what is the clue to that particular question and how they can make you confuse in the exam so you need to find out the trap you need to find out the clue when you are able to do that then only you will be able to get it right in the exam and as we discussed in our th theory class that amc exam is for 150 questions you get 120 questions which is a scored and other are non scored obviously the last 20 questions will be always scored each of the questions there is only one correct answer if you get it wrong there is no minus marking so you can choose anyone it, you don't need to think that if i choose it wrong then i will get minus mark that's one of the good thing and another important thing is that if you don't choose the answer you cannot go to the next question so you have to choose a question answer if you don't choose this then you cannot go to the next question and if you go to the next question you cannot come back you can only come back after finishing your 150 questions then during this time you can flag your question sometimes what will happen if you go into our software and you appear our exam questions then you will be very much acquainted with the exam software as well so in here there will be like next button somewhere around here there will be a flagging option so what you can do if you are not sure about the answer of that question you can click the flag option here choose anyone from here and go to the next question after finishing 150 question then they will show you all the questions what you have answered which one you have flagged then what you can do you can just click your flat question and then come back to that flat question and then change the answer remember if you change your answer it doesn't cause any problem with your marking but what happens that if if you choose one answer here your next question comes based on your answer like if you are able to answer correctly the software will give you a little bit more difficult question if you are able to answer that then software will give you a little bit more difficult questions so your difficulty will increase increase and increase based on how much you are correcting all right but if you change your answer at the end that doesn't cost you any mark and you will get the exact mark if you would choose the correct one at the first time okay so these are the basic thing you should always know and as i said in the first session that if you cannot finish 150 questions in the exam your marking will not be there and the software will mark you as a failed candidate so always try to finish your exam even though your time is running up just click some of the options and at least finish it you have to click on the finish button and the very very important thing that many on many of you might not know because you had not any experience in these things before you have to submit your answer at the end the software will ask you that are you sure that you want to submit your answer then you have to submit it click yes and then only after that your marks or your pass or fail will come up remember these things these are very important all right let's stop all this jib jab now we'll start with our session today no negative marking dr shaila okay so we have got our first question it, there is a schizophrenic patient to undergo non psychiatric related management what in patient will determine if he is capable to give consent so you have got a schizophrenic patient who is going to have a non psychiatric related management like she's she will need a surgery or she might need an invasive procedure and you want to take the consent from that patient 
what in patient will determine if he is capable to give the consent. One, is a schizophrenic patient, alcohol intake, C, inability to comprehend consequences, insight, and judgment. What do you think? Now, first of all, let's exclude options. First of all, any patient who is schizophrenic doesn't make them unable to give consent. That's one of the very important thing you should remember. Sometimes even if patient is schizophrenic, if it is well controlled, patient can understand the consequences, patient can understand what is the procedure going to be happened, so, and patient has the insight to give the consent. So schizophrenia is out. Again, alcohol intake, like most, like most of the Australian people take alcohol and then like 80% will be unable to give consent. So this option is out. Inability to comprehend consequences. This is a very good option. If a patient is unable to comprehend the consequence of a procedure, obviously that will determine if he is capable to give consent or not. Now, if you see the next option inside, now remember one thing, obviously in the exam, you will always be confused between two options. Like you can exclude judgment also because judgment is also important, but not that important like insight. Any patient who doesn't have an insight cannot give consent to any procedure, even if it is medical, surgical, psychiatric. So insight is the most important thing to make sure that they are able to give any consent. If insight is not in the option, then C will be the best option to choose because it's a kind of same meaning. A patient who has insight, they have the ability to comprehend the consequences. But insight is a, like a big term which includes everything. If a patient has insight, they can understand everything. They can understand what is the procedure going to happen? What is the benefit of the procedure? What is the alternative of the procedure? That means all the informed consent we give to a patient before a procedure, if a patient has insight, they can easily understand all those things. It's just not the consequences Patient needs to understand. Patient needs to understand the whole thing. All right. Now, obviously, sometimes insight judgment may not be in the option. Then we would choose inability to comprehend consequences. But insight in the option, we will obviously choose insight because this is the best thing. Now, the next question to you guys, which tool you can use to find out if a patient has insight or if a patient is capable to give consent. What is the bedside tool we use for that? What is the exact name of that? Now, it's not called MSC. It called MMSC. Now, what's the difference between MSC and MMSC? MSC means mental status examination. Mental status examination includes everything like men mental status examination includes the speech of a patient, judgment, cognition, insight, any hallucination, any delusion, all these things, like means a total psychiatric history means taking the mental status examination. But mini mental status examination, that's we use as a bedside tool to diagnose how much inside a patient has, or mainly we use it to see the dementia. And mini mental status, if you divide it into three parts, then it becomes mild, moderate, and severe. We usually keep mild like more than 20, you can keep it as a mild. 
10 to 20 moderate, less than 10 severe. Less than 10 mini mental status score, patient is never ever able to give consent. Sometimes moderate, like if a patient has MMSC score 18, 19, 20, they are still able to give co consent if they understand and the, if they have the insight. All right, so this is important things that you need to remember. Next. More than 10 can give consent, but still we need to see that in the MMSC, when we actually measure the insight of a patient, if that insight is there or not. So that's very vital. And in the MMSC, like if MMSC is 10, 11, 12, still we would say no, this patient most likely unable to give consent. It depends on how is the understanding of that patient. All right, so it's not only the MMSC, it also includes the understanding of the consequences, understanding everything. So giving a consent to a procedure or anything, it's a whole combination of a patient perspective. Like they need a good MMSC, they need a good insight, they need to show that they has that capacity. And also usually this sort of MMSC is done by the occupational therapist in a hospital or any GP center. Occupational therapist will do this cognitive assessment and they will give you the result that if this patient is able to give the consent or not. All right, so that's mainly insight. There is no usual cutoff point to give a consent. We cannot like make an appropriate cutoff point, but we can still keep it as like more than 10 patient will be, patient should be able to give consent, but still we need to look into all other things to come to a conclusion. But less than 10 always, it's, it's not going to be helpful. And patient who has less than 10 MMSA score, they don't have insight most of the time. So in that situation, patient will not be able to give consent. But we usually we don't have any exact cutoff point to give consent. Yes, Dr. Jarin, if you don't finish your exam, like even if it's just one question left and you cannot submit, then your, your exam will come as a fail. Next question, pregnant lady with regular periods, 35 to 45 days apart. So this question is a little bit of complex. So you see that you have got a patient who is pregnant. Before getting pregnant, patient had regular periods in 35 to 45 days apart. Complaints of breast tenderness and nausea on speculum examination, noted minimal spotting or bleeding, had a transvaginal ultrasound which showed empty gestational sac. What will help in diagnosing non-viable pregnancy? So most likely this question is not totally complete as I can understand, but by the look of the question, I, what I can see that this is a pregnant lady we don't know the last menstrual period in here. So that's actually a problem to find out the, find out the exact diagnosis. But if it's a pregnant patient, obviously early pregnancy patient had this, this breast tenderness, early morning nausea, vomiting. That's one of the thing. And also if that patient comes to you with spotting or bleeding, we have to think about like it could be a miscarriage or even it could be ectopic pregnancy. So you did a transvaginal ultrasound which showed empty gestational sac. So what will help you in diagnosing non-viable pregnancy? Last menstrual period death, persistent bleeding, low beta HCG, decreased breast tenderness and nausea, repeat transvaginal ultrasound after seven days. Look at the question, 
first of all, you did a transvaginal ultrasound today. So doing a repeat TVS after seven days doesn't help at all. You need to find out something today, okay? So se seven days, it's like long for a patient if that patient has an ectopic or if this patient has um, miscarriage. Decreased breast tenderness and nausea, it's a just kind of subjective symptoms. We cannot rely on these sort of symptoms to diagnose anything. Persistent bleeding cannot help you to diagnose non-viable pregnancy. Like what if this, like, even if it's a persistent bleeding and we don't do any investigation, we cannot totally say that it's a non-viable or viable pregnancy. Again, LMP date is not important now because you already did a transvaginal ultrasound that should show you the exact pregnancy age, right? So LMP date is not really important. Now, low beta HCG would be the best option to choose. As I can see, most of you has also chosen that. Low beta HCG can help you with diagnosing early pregnancy or like any early pregnancy problem. Like if a patient is f less than five to six weeks pregnant, then transvaginal ultrasound cannot help you to diagnose viable or non-viable pregnancy. You have to only rely on beta ECG level before five to six weeks. If beta HCG comes more than 2000 and then you do an ultrasound, if that shows that there is no gestational sac and patient is pregnant, most likely that becomes an ectopic pregnancy. Because after beta HCG more than 2000, transvaginal ultrasound should confirm gestational sac. Clear everyone? Now, most likely this pregnancy is less than five to six weeks. So we cannot totally rely on TVS. So if the beta HCG does not correlate with the age of the pregnancy, then we can say that, well, it might not be a viable pregnancy. Or what we can do, we can do serial beta HCG every 48 hours to see if the beta HCG getting doubled in every 48 hours. If it gets doubled, that means it's good. Probably that's a viable pregnancy. If it's, if it's not increasing or if it's just reducing and reducing, that means it's a non-viable pregnancy. Clear? Any question about this? So you have to remember transvaginal ultrasound in the early weeks of pregnancy cannot confirm viability of a pregnancy. If beta HCG more than 2000 and you do a TVS and it shows that there is no gestational sac, that at that time it can confirm the viability or non-viability. So beta HCG has to be more than 2000 to confirm anything by TVS. If it is less than 2000, you cannot rely on TVS. At that time, you have to do the serial beta HCG level. So this option will be C. Let's move to the next question. Jehovah Witness, pregnant patient, most likely which one of the following will she refuse if needed? So Jehovah Witness means like those patients, that there is a group of people who usually don't take any blood or blood product transfusion. Those are called Jehovah Witness. So if, it's a, if a Jehovah Witness become pregnant, what is the most important one she can refuse if it's needed? So rubella post-exposure prophylaxis, NT, D immune, NTD, HPV vaccine, MMR vaccine. Very easy if you think a little bit of critical way. See, you, you don't give rubella post-exposure prophylaxis, right? Because if you see, this is human normal immunoglobulin is not routinely used for post-exposure protection from rubella since there is no evidence that it, it is effective. 
So post, rubella post exposure prophylaxis, usually we don't offer immunoglobulin. So this is out. HPV vaccine, can you give HPV vaccine in a pregnant patient? No, you cannot because it's a live vaccine. So again, it's out. MMR vaccine also is a live attenuated vaccine. So this you cannot give. So only option is your NTD. And NTD, it's made from plasma obtained from the human blood. So Jehovah Witness patients, they don't use anything which comes from blood. That means no blood or blood products. Okay. So obviously this Jehovah patient, if it's if it's a pregnant patient, most likely she will refuse the NTD. Oh, all right, uh, Dr. Sabira, the sharp noise that is coming is most likely from my alarm, the smoke alarm. Sorry for that. Uh, so the next one is Aboriginal smoker, ambivalent to quit smoking, but ever that it can affect his health. What is the management? So you have got an Aboriginal smoker who is ambivalent to quit smoking. Ambivalent means that like not certain in the middle, right? So if you push a little bit, might be he... He can quit smoking. So ambivalent to quit smoking, but ever that it affects his health. What is the management you want to give? So motivational therapy, bupropion, high dish cigarettes, nicotine patch. So obviously this one you can out totally. So if any patient is like, like, yeah, I, I'm I I can stop smoking or I'm not totally sure I may not be able to so when a patient is ambivalent or not totally certain that they can quit smoking they need some push up from you that pushing comes from the motivation so this sort of patient will need a motivational therapy you cannot just give bupropion or nicotine patch for those patients who doesn't who is not totally sure that they want to quit smoking when a patient says that, yes, doctor, I want to quit smoking, then you can help those patients with nicotine patch, bupropion, those sort of things. Here, everyone, any question? And about this nicotine patch, bupropion, there is a lot, like a lot of discussion we will do. And we will have some questions on those. And at the time we'll discuss about like when we can give nicotine patch, what is the contraindication of nicotine patch, when we can give bupropion and what are the contraindications or of those sort of things. And there is some questions like questions related to find out the dependency of smoking. All these things we have to discuss and we will discuss those sort of things later on. Any question from these sort of things? Apart from your nicotine replacement therapy, you have vermiclin. That's also one of the nicotinic nicotine receptor agonist, which we can use for smoking cessation. Uh, 
and the bupropion is like some of the patient will have some difficulty with nicotine therapy and those sort of like some patient they don't want nicotine they, they they don't want to use any nicotine replacement at that time you can use the bupropion which also is an antidepressant usually effective for patients who are a smoker but has associated cardiac disease or respiratory disease like COPD. Okay. Because nicotine replacement therapy can increase a little increased chance of cardiac or respiratory disease. So usually if any patient has extensive ischemic heart disease or severe COPD, then we will use it in those patients. But you cannot use bupropion in a patient who has history of epilepsy who has history of eating disorder. All right. Next question, 64 year old smoker. So we are going to do a CBD risk assessment. Very important for your exam. It can come anytime in the exam. And these are like, I would say mastery questions for your exam. So you need to find out how to do a CVS risk assessment. Usually we do it as a five yearly risk assessment. There will be a chart like this will be given to your exam and they will give all the information need to fill up this chart. If you look at this chart, this chart is for people without diabetes. They has one for men, other for women, smoker and non-smoker. In the Y axis, you can see the in the y-axis, you can see the systolic blood pressure is given in here. And in the x-axis, you can see the total cholesterol and HDL ratio is given here. And also, this chart is divided according to the age of the patient. Now you know how the chart looks like. It's a 64-year-old smoker woman. Right, so you need to go in that. This is a woman, smoker, and 64. So this one. So we are looking in this area, right? So first of all, focus your area. That will help you to uh, like understand that why I where I need to look at. After that, you got a systolic blood pressure 135, cholesterol HDL ratio 6.6 is to 1. Now, blood pressure, 135. So if you see, this is for 120, this is 140, 160, 179. Now, this is the part where you need to understand the chart. In the chart, if you look, these are all small boxes, right? The lowest box you can see here, the upper limit of systolic blood pressure for this box, okay, for this box is 130, not 120, okay? So 130 will be the upper limit. For the next box, 150. For this box, 170, okay? So obviously always more than 10 of what is written in here. So 130, 150, 170 in this way. So if it is 135, where I will put my first point in the first box or in the second box? Second box, right? Because it's 130 is the first box maximum. So 135 will go here, right? So I've got that one. Now I need to find out the x-axis. It says that cholesterol HDL ratio is 6.6. .6. For 6.6, .6, now you need to understand the cholesterol HDL ratio thing. For this box, the highest limit is 4.5, not, not 4, okay, 4.5. Then this one is 5.5. 
then this one is 6.5, 7.5, Okay, now you know that this patient has 6.6. .6. For 6.6, .6, it will be in your first, second, third, fourth, or fifth, which box you will choose. So up to 6.5 is this box, third box. So 6.6 .6 will go into the fourth box. So now you have got that one also. So you just go up, 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 up. So you have got this green one, right? Sorry, yeah, so she's a smoker, sorry. So she's a smoker, so we'll go from one, two, three, four. So this one. Okay. So this yellow one will be our box. Now for, for all this color in the exam, they will give you the percentage of risk in the five year prediction. So let's see that what will be the, what, we, what it will look like. So if we go into this Australian guideline, then you will see it's written very well here. So this is how it will look like. Our patient falls in this yellow box. So what will be the answer? 16 to 19%. All right, so you see that whatever I said is written here. For example, the lower left cell contains all non-smokers without diabetes who are 35 to 44 years, have a cholesterol ratio less than 4.5, systolic blood pressure less than 130. Okay, so that's the, this box they're talking about, the lower left box. So maximum is less than 130, and cholesterol HDL is less than 4.5. Now, Dr. Aisha, this gives your question's answer. So it's less than 130. So if it's in the margin of 130, then it will be in the second box. That means in the next box. Any times, it's, if it's a marginal, like if it is 130, 150, it will go in the next box. Clear? No, you don't need to remember these percentages because it will be given in your exam question. Clear everyone, this, part, this thing is very important for your exam and many candidates doesn't know these things. Okay, then let's move on. Yes, Dr. Manal. So if BP is 130, that means it's in the marginal, so it will go into the next box. That means second box, right? Next question, recently diagnosed colon cancer, what is the most likely complaint patient can come to you? Recent change in bowel habit, lethargy or malaise, melena, parvectal bleeding, and abdominal pain. Yes, that's a good thing. Like if it is right-sided, then most likely lethargy or malaise. That means patient usually comes with tiredness. If it is left-sided cancer, then most likely the patient comes to you with a recent change in bowel habit. Now, sometimes question can become very confusing. Like they might not say that if it's a right or left. In such cases, you have to choose the best option. Like 
even if it is right or left colon cancer, the most important or most likely complaint every patient will have is the tiredness or lethargy. Not just PR bleeding, not melena, not abdominal pain, not change in bowel habit, but every patient will have some tiredness. So in that case, we have to choose this one. But obviously, if they say that it's a cecal cancer or if it's a sigmoid cancer, then we can easily understand it by the right and left. In a normal way, right-sided colon cancer mainly presents with iron deficiency anemia. So the patient, they usually presents with fatigue, malaise, those sort of symptoms. If it's a sigmoid cancer, that means the left-sided cancer, patient usually comes with altered bowel habit. And they can come to you with parietal bleeding, acute intestinal obstruction, those are okay. Yeah, Dr. Amanji, the, yeah, that's, the, that's a very good important thing you said. So change in bowel habit, not an early feature. Early feature is mainly anemia, weight loss, those sort of things comes early. So if it's just like this, then we would choose lethargy or malaise. But we know if right or left comes up, then obviously we will choose in that way. Next question, 34 year old coming with abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, pain exacerbated by eating, decreased by defecating. It means passing stool what to do next? What is your diagnosis? So it's a 34 year old patient coming to you with abdominal pain. The very important clue in here is that it's a 34. So cancer is a very, very unlikely. And the next one is the when, a, when an abdominal pain relieves with passing stool, that's most likely irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. But still, you cannot diagnose irritable bowel syndrome without excluding other important causes. So what do you want to do? You want to do a coronoscopy, review in three months, endoscopy, full blood examination, CRP, reassure with dietary modification. Now, question is what to do next? What do you want to do next? Look at the, look at your GM. Your GM has the answer. So your GM said IBS is a diagnosis of exclusion. A thorough physical examination, investigation, and colonoscopy are necessary. In the investigation, they have given you full blood examination, ESR, stool microscopy culture, and colonoscopy. If we follow JM, then it's a better option. As they ask, what do you want to do next? It's a better option to choose full blood examination and ESR. Okay, just to rule out any inflammatory causes of this problem. Obviously, after doing the full blood ESR, then yes, if they ask what is the most appropriate thing you will do, then we will do the chronoscopy in here. Or if in the question they say that there is a family history of colon cancer or some relative had a colon, colon cancer, we will jump up to colonoscopy because then the patient becomes high risk. So according to the GM, we will do next as our full blood examination and CRP, okay? Only after you exclude all other option, like this patient has mainly three important differentials. One is in inflammatory bowel disease. Second is celiac disease. Third is colon cancer. So for these three things, you are doing full blood ESR CRP to rule out, like at least to find out if this is an inflammatory thing or not, doing a CRP will help. Then colonoscopy mainly will help you with everything. And sometimes even after that, you might need to do a celiac screening as well. Only after that, you can totally say that it's a IBS. So irritable bowel syndrome, just basically it's 
mainly this this is a kind of psychological issue patient usually because it's a young adult patient who is under a lot of stress or anxiety issues presents to you with recurrent abdominal pain and sometimes they can have predominant diarrhea predominant constipation or sometimes both diarrhea and constipation on and off and mainly if it's a constipation the patient usually has abdominal pain which gets better after passing stool that's one of the important clue and even after doing everything in here if there was the option of taking a psychosocial history you should choose that first because always always there will be some underlying psychiatric issues in these patients so better if if any options like that like take take a total psychosocial history okay then obviously choose that option because this is a condition in which if you are under a lot of stress then what happen that the peristalsis of the abdominal or intestinal muscles increases and then it can cause diarrhea sometimes it can decrease causing constipation so usually it it makes some trouble with your peristalsis so abnormal peristalsis and it usually related to some anxiety related issues so obviously look for any psychosocial history or any anxiety any stress this patient is on or not because you have to address that otherwise patient will always have the ideas next question tuberculosis case symptomatic with x ray picture of cavitation in the upper right side so you have got a patient who is having symptoms of tuberculosis which means low grade fever cough sputum production weight loss malaise and you did a x ray which shows lung finding which is a cavitation and you ordered a sputum cytology what is the next investigation you want to do monto test ct scan bronchoscopy drug susceptibility testing igra for this question we need to go into the rscgp guideline rscgp guideline is very good for your medicine related questions so always try to search that this is a purely australian guideline so we are not going in detail of what is tb and everything that will be discussed in our theory session but for here if you consider any patient having a tb next thing you need to see that if this patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic if it is asymptomatic then it's latent tb you need to do either tuberculin skin test which is monto test or igra if monto or igra positive you can exclude active tb okay so if if you if you got a patient who doesn't have any symptom but monto or igra any of these is positive you need to exclude active tb so how you exclude active tb if any patient has symptoms of tb or any of this tst igra positive you need to do two things one is chest x ray first and then sputum microscopy and culture and you need to take three samples sample to confirm your diagnosis most of the time that's only we do but your question asks more than that if you go down then you can say you can do some molecular assay or most importantly you can do a drug susceptibility testing which means that you are trying to see if the first line medication that we use for a tb patient if your patient is susceptible to that drug or not or sometimes multi resistant tb can be there so that's why we need to do a drug susceptibility testing okay so in this case the next best thing to do will be a drug susceptibility test 
Now, if drug susceptibility test is not in the option, then what you will do? Then you can do a CT scan. But I don't know, like CT scan or bronchoscopy is not needed to diagnose TB. But sometimes if you don't have any, any good option, then yeah, it's better to do a CT scan. Next, 16 year old male athlete presented with gynecomasia, history of asthma controlled by salbutamol and fluticasan, what is the most likely cause? Normal adolescent gynecomasia, salbutamol, fluticasan, anabolic steroid use. What do you think? Very important clue in this question is athlete. 16 year old athlete probably most of the most of the athletes and athlete means it's a clue for anabolic steroid all right does fluticasan salbutamol causes gynecomasia no now why it's not a normal adolescent gynecomasia let's see that what is pubertal gynecomasia this is a 16 year old Usually, boy or usually the boys should have their puberty before 14 years of age. So 16 years, we don't think is as a normal pubertal gynecomasia. If, it, if this patient came to you before 14 years old, and it was, they, do, they did not say it to you that it's a gynecomasia, then you can think about pubertal or normal adolescent gynecomasia. What happens? In here, pubertal gynecomasia, it's occur in during the male puberty time. And it's a very transient phenomenon. It will gradually resolve within two to three years. And you will get a palpable disc of breast tissue, which is a kind of quite firm to palpate. There is no treatment needed, no surgical removal needed. Just review the patient. Okay, and obviously in the question, they would not give you this male athlete. If athlete is not in here, and it's say like a 10 year old boy coming to you, like uh, coming to you because the other schoolmates bullying him because of increased breast tissue or increased breast mass. Okay, and that's why the parents brought the child to you. That's most likely pubertal gynecomasia question. But if a 16 year old athlete comes to you with gynecomasia, we would choose anabolic steroid use as our first thing. Pubertal gynecomasia means before, like during the puberty time, if anyone has a disc like lesion around the nipple or areola, that's pubertal gynecomasia. So before 14 year old. If you go to the RACGB guideline, you will find out the causes of gynecomasia also. See, this is how gynecomasia looks like. Remember one thing, in true gynecomasia, you will always get a farm tissue that is concentric with the nipple areolar complex, not outside the nipple or areolar complex. And it usually bilateral, although unilateral can have be there. Remember male having a bilateral breast cancer is very unlikely. So the medication that causes gynecomasia is spironolactone, Digoxin, very, very important, these two medication, amiodarone, then others like estrogen, antiandrogens, you have your anabolic steroids. Okay. Now, sometimes they can give you a spironolactone and digoxin, like a 35-year-old patient having multiple medical comorbidities, using both spironolactone and digoxin for many years and coming to you with a gynecomasia. What do you want to do? Or what is the most likely cause? Spiro or digoxin? Most important is spironolactone. 
common most common will be spinal lactone that's the most likely cause okay and most of the time this drug induced comes as a bilateral gynecomastia but it can be unilateral as well Next one, 35 year old patient coming to you. So not coming to you. So 35 year old patient, maybe in your ward after colectomy, there is no urine output for the last eight hours. What is the next thing you are going to do? Trial with hydration, insert Foley's catheter, serum creatinine or bun, blood urea nitrogen, bladder ultrasound, use diuretics what do you want to do so let's let's discuss this thing very important for the exam any patient coming to you or you got it in the exam like it's a post operative oliguria or anuria First important cause you need to rule out is urinary retention because that's the most likely cause. So first urinary retention, you need to rule that out. To rule out urinary retention, what you do next, you do the bladder ultrasound, which is a bedside bladder scan. In every ward we have it. So we do a bladder scan, see that how much residual urine in the bladder if it is more than 600 ml, so that's a retention. Now, if bladder ultrasound shows retention, then what you do next, you insert the Foley's catheter. Sometimes if bladder ultrasound is not in the option, we go for catheterization immediately. So first of all, this first one is ruling out any urinary retention. The next most appropriate one is to rule out pre-renal failure. Maybe because during the operation patient lost blood, there is also some like change in the fluid status of the patient's body. So patient might get dehydrated and that can cause the anuria or oliguria. So what do you do? You do a fluid challenge test. So in fluid challenge test, you give a bolus dose of 250 ml normal saline and then again check for the urine output. If the urine output increases, that means patient was mainly dehydrated and after giving the fluid, urine output is now better. So that is your fluid challenge test or trial with hydration. Now it's still after giving the fluid challenge, urine output is not improved the last option so it could be a renal failure so to diagnose renal failure what you do you check the serum urea creatinine and gfr okay so that will be your last thing to do so in this case what you are going to do you've got a patient no urine output and the next thing will be to do a bladder ultrasound Remember, if a patient is already catheterized, there is no role of bladder ultrasound because if you catheterize a patient, there will be nothing in the bladder, right? We don't give diuretics for post-operative anuria. Yeah, so before Foley's catheter, you need to do a bladder scan because after Foley's catheter, doing a bladder scan doesn't help because if you insert a catheter, all the urine should come to your catheter, right? You will not get anything in the bladder scan. Yeah, so if this patient was catheterized, then answer would be trial with hydration. Good. So if we quickly brief the orders, Dr. Matthew, 
So the thing will be, first of all, you need to rule out urinary retention. So do bladder ultrasound. If bladder ultrasound shows retention, then you insert the catheter. Even after inserting the catheter, there is nothing coming out or there is no urine output. Then you do a fluid challenge test by giving a bolus of 250 ml normal saline. If after giving the bolus, patient starts having the urine output, it means that patient had some dehydration. That means it was a pre-renal failure. But if even after fluid challenge test, patient urine output is not increased, then the last option to do a serum urine, serum creatinine or GFR to check renal failure. Like in this case, the best option next, everything is same. Okay, we have to go in this order. All right, so yes, so we need to do a bladder, bladder ultrasound. So obviously, uh, Dr. MS, what's your name? I don't know, but yeah, they will never ever in the exam, they will just write ultrasound. They will say abdominal ultrasound, bladder ultrasound. So they will specify it, obviously. Next, a 32 year old woman who is a known case of uncontrolled hypertension taking warfarin for six months is presented with sharp abdominal pain, CT scan likes below. What is the diagnosis? Very commonly asked question. So remember one thing, if any patient is with warfarin, warfarin increases the chance of bleeding intra-abdominally or everywhere in the body. And if they pay presence to you with abdominal pain, always think about rectus sheath hematoma. And the CT scan also will confirm the diagnosis. So you can see, see this is your rectus sheath hematoma. The rectus sheath is this one in your right side. And the hematoma is in, in between the rectus sheath. Okay. Very easy to diagnose. So if the patient is warfarin coming to you with abdominal pain and you get this sort of lobulated um, kind of mass, I would say, then think about rectus sheath hematoma. Next, a 75-year-old man with fever, cough, and rigors had chronic cough with greenish yellow sputum for three years and persistent bilateral basal crepitation his chest x-ray looks like below. What is the most appropriate treatment for him? So what, what do you think this chest x-ray shows? So you can always compare the right and left. The left seems to be okay, but in here you can see there is a consolidation in the left, in the right lower lobe, right? So now, you have got a patient with consolidation, but look at the question. It's a 75, having fever, cough, rigors, and having consolidation. That means this patient at this moment having pneumonia, but there is a past history of chronic cough with greenish yellow sputum. Anytime greenish yellow sputum is in the question, think about pseudomonas. And pseudomonas is associated with a very particular condition in the chest, which we call bronchiectasis. And bronchiectasis patient will have the sort of chronic cough with copious amount of sputum production. And also if you, if you auscultate the chest, you will get this bilateral crepitation. So this case is acute like pneumonia on the background of bronchiectasis. So for those patients who has bronchiectasis and comes to you with pneumonia and has this greenish sputum, you have to cover them for pseudomonas. How we cover them with pseudomonas? We give piperacillin and tazobectum or ticarcillin, piperacillin. So anything you can, 
choose, you can choose tazobactam and piperacillin or ticarcillin piperacillin. Clear? Now, if you go into your gym, bronchiectasis is a condition which causes permanent irreversible dilatation of your bronchi. Okay? And in this case, your bronchus becomes dilated, thickened, and it actually lost the power to expel mucus, mucus. Now, if there is collection of mucus, it causes recurrent infection in your lungs. That's the pathophysiology. Predisposing causes is like measles, TB, foreign body, cancer, cystic fibrosis. Okay. Feature is chronic cough yellow green sputum most of the time and it's a profuse purulent sputum and patient can have multiple episodes of pneumonia. On examination you can get clubbing and coarse crepitation mainly by basilar. Initial investigation is to do a chest x-ray and also send the sputum for microscopy and culture. The commonest organism is Haemophilus influenzae. Very important, always remember the commonest organism for infections. Other than this, you have a Streptococci and Pseudomonas. A chest X-ray might not be able to confirm the diagnosis. Only thing that confirms the diagnosis is high resolution CT scan. That is the gold standard. So if they ask what is the most appropriate investigation, that will be HR CT scan. Management is to postural drainage by the chest physiotherapist and you have to give antibiotics. Now, if it's first time patient presents to you, you can start with amoxiclav. But most of the time, because this patient has a chronic bronchiectasis, our patient, right? Chronic bronchiectasis now coming to you with a episodes of pneumonia, giving amoxiclav, roxithromycin, this doesn't help. For initial or first time presentation of bronchiectasis patient, you can give amoxiclav at the first time. Dr. Asha, what's your question? If it is community acquired, normal person, no structural lung condition, what's the antibiotic as for Australia? Well, it depends on, like, then it becomes just a pneumonia, right? For pneumonia, again, we have to discuss those pneumonia questions. There are lots of pneumonia questions which we will discuss in our classes. But pneumonia divides into mild, moderate, and severe. If it's a community-acquired pneumonia, depending on the severity, we choose the antibiotic. Like, if a patient can tolerate oral antibiotics, not, not that much severe, vitally stable, those patients can be treated as the outpatient just with oral amoxiclav. If the patient cannot tolerate oral fluids or oral antibiotics, okay, and a kind of like more than 50 years of old, those patients need IV benzyl penicillin. Sometimes patient can be very severe, like CARB 65, there is a thing by which we can find out the severity of pneumonia. So if the patient is confused, if the urea high, blood pressure low, respiratory rate more than 30, okay, age more than 65, those patients, if they get more than two a score, that patient needs a severe pneumonia treatment, which means we need to go for IV captraxin. Okay, and the, those patients also needs to be admitted in the ICU. So it depends on those sort of things. We will discuss the, those things in our class. Don't worry, it's a long discussion. Now it's see that oral or IV doesn't it doesn't depend on the age of the patient. It depends on the condition of the patient. If the patient is like looking ill or sick you cannot send the patient to the outpatient or home, okay? And patient is like middle age, more than 40 or, 40 or more than 50 year old. 
and having nausea vomiting okay and having a little bit of hypoxia also so that patient we give iv benzoyl penicillin there is a question in your handbook where the handbook has chosen iv benzoyl penicillin look at that question that will give you a good idea so it depends on the state of the patient that which one we will choose iv or oral but ace doesn't define antibiotic okay So we, you can also go through this RSCGP guideline that will help. Next, women three hours into the labor, everything was okay. Suddenly it starts bleeding, blood pressure drops, baby pulse drops, what is the reason? So you have got a patient who is in three hours labor, everything is okay. And suddenly that patient started bleeding. Blood pressure dropped, baby pulses dropped. Now, obviously see that you need to rule out some of the options to get to, a, get to the best options. First of all, rule out coagulation disorder because if it is a coagulation disorder, usually it is it starts after delivery, okay? And obviously patient will not just bleed from the down below, they will start bleeding from everywhere. Placenta accreta. So let's discuss what is placenta accreta. So, sorry. So placenta accreta is a high risk pregnancy complication that happens when placenta becomes embedded too deeply in the uterine wall. So if the placenta embedded too deeply into the uterine wall, what will happen? Normally after delivery of your baby, placenta should come out immediately. In placenta accreta, placenta remain attached to the uterine wall. If placenta doesn't come out, it will cause severe bleeding. So it should happen after delivery of the baby, right? So this patient is still into the labor. So you can ob obviously cross out this placenta accreta. So CND is out. Amniotic embolism, very good option to choose. Let's read something about amniotic embolism, how they present. Amniotic fluid embolism is an extremely rare but life-threatening complication that can happen shortly before, during, or immediately after birth. Most usually occur during labor. It is a hypothesis that it happens due to a severe allergic reaction to the amniotic fluid or fetal cell that enter into the mother's blood during the labor time. Amniotic fluid embolism can happen immediately without any risk factor identified. Signs and symptoms. The symptoms develop very rapidly. Initially, patient starts to have difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, abnormally rapid breathing, which is tachypnea, low blood pressure, an abnormally rapid heartbeat, which means tachycardia. So patient will go into shock, hypotension, tachycardia. Now, very important finding is this thing. That means it's a embolism. It causes shortness of breath and hypoxia and increased respiratory rate, which is tachypnea. And also 
the patient can develop cyanosis, hypoxia, and later on, patient can develop pulmonary hypertension. Mainly, the first thing that happens is the cardiorespiratory failure. The next phase, the patient developed a condition called DIC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation. What happened in DIC, the blood clotting factors that help the blood to clot are used up or broken down. And without this clotting factor, women cannot create blood clots to stop bleeding. And then patient starts bleeding from uterus, from puncture site, from the site of an IV needle, or from a catheter. So the important thing to understand that the patient will not just only start bleeding from parvaginal area, patient will start bleeding from everywhere because patient doesn't have any clotting factor. That should be a clue in your, in your question. Now, if you come to here, I can't see any such clue in this case. So women into the labor, everything is okay. Suddenly it starts bleeding, blood pressure drops, baby pulse drops. What I suspect that this question might be a lot bigger than what it looks like, and it might be more complete. Okay, so we, dis, we ruled out this one. Amniotic embolism is less likely given patient is just bleeding from, we don't know from where the patient is bleeding. That will be also given in the exam question. So depending on that, amniotic embolism, patient will bleed from everywhere and they can have this sort of like shortness of breath, tachycardia, tachypnea, those things will be there. Placenta previa doesn't come suddenly. And in a normal pregnant patient, usually suddenly patient doesn't have a placenta previa because everything was okay. That means before labor, obviously ultrasonogram and everything was done, nothing was problematic. So placenta previa is very unlikely to come as suddenly. And placental abruption could be the best option in here because placental abruption can appear suddenly because the detachment what is placental abruption detachment of the placenta from the uterine wall and that can appear suddenly okay that can appear suddenly and that is the best diagnosis when patient starts having severe bleeding blood pressure drops that means patient goes into shock and most of the time there can be fetal death in utero, which means that baby will be also affected. So baby pulse can drop. So if placental abruption is an option in here, choose that one. Now, what if it's not an option, then we only have embol amniotic embolism to choose. Okay, because this one cannot be the option. Okay. So in this case, we will choose placental abruption, not the amniotic embolism. Now, the next question, see the question, same type, a woman in her second pregnancy is with twins. After the delivery of the second one, her condition deteriorates with low blood pressure, high pulse rate, and bleeding from the site of the catheter. That's the thing I was talking about, right? So patient having bleeding from the site of the catheter, patient also obviously having bleeding from parvaginal area and having hypotension tachycardia. So that is how amniotic fluid embolism appears. Clear? So see that how we can find out the cages, it always depends on these sort of things. You need to have a good idea on the cages. It's just not like, I guess that this question and this question would be the similar question, most likely. Maybe this question is the complete one, the former one was not a complete one. But if 
we don't get any bleeding from any catheter IV side, we cannot choose it's a embolism because amniotic fluid embolism causes bleeding due to DIC. And if it's a DIC, that means there is no clotting factors left, so patient will start bleeding from everywhere. Okay. Women with filchy clips with three children, this is this clipping means by like most of the time it's a tubal ligation. So permanent method of esterilization. With three children having severe menorrhagia, doesn't want hysterectomy. What will you give? Mirana, OCP, POP, DMPA, myomectomy. Very easy question. For menorrhagia patient, the best hormonal medication or hormonal option is Mirena, okay? So if a patient has tubal ligation with family complete, sometimes we want, we give the option of doing the hysterectomy. But if patient doesn't want, then Mirena is the best option. Next one is your Fluid balance. Now, this is a question which, like, which is a very, very important topic for your exam, like your cardiovascular risk chart. And you need to know how to calculate this thing. Otherwise, in the exam hall, you will never ever be able to answer the correct one. Now, in a fluid balance chart, Sorry, so Dr. Jarin Yusuf has asked, can Mirena be given in young if she wants three hours contraception? What is three hours contraception? Oh yeah, three years contraception. Yes, Mirena is a, it's a reversible, right? You can, if it, it's a reversible long acting contraceptive. So you can give it if a patient wants three years contraception, even Mirena gives you five years protection. And it can be used in young nulliparous women as well. That's written in your jam. You can give it in a young nulliparous, elderly, like middle age. Any patient is a good candidate to have a Mirna. So how to do the fluid balance? When you do the fluid balance, you have to find out how much you have given to the patient and how much patient has the output. So look at the question. So patient had an emergency right hemicolectomy. Two days after the operation, this is the fluid balance sheet. Intravenous input you have given is two liter. So you have given two liter to the patient. This is your input. The output with nasogastric aspiration is two liter. Drain loss is 700 ml. Urine output 500 ml. Okay, now every patient has a insensible loss which you cannot see like maybe from the sweat from like sometimes like evaporation from the skin so this is called insensible loss which we keep it as a 500 for every patient so if you add this one it becomes roughly four liter okay so patient's input is two liter output is four liter what is the deficit patient is having? Four minus two, which means two liter deficit. Okay. Now remember this line, any post-operative patient, their usual maintenance dose is one liter normal saline plus two liter dextrose. Plus, now the potassium replacement, it depends you start it in the second postoperative day. You give 20 milli equivalent of potassium for every liter. So you give 20 for every liter. 
Now, our patient has two liter deficit. This and our patient obviously will get this maintenance fluid, but he will need this extra two liter. How you are going to give this extra two liter? You are going to give it this extra two liter by normal saline. So add this two with the one, so it becomes three liter. So now you're going to give three liter normal saline, two liter dextrose. How much total fluid you are giving to this patient every 24 hour, five liter. So how much potassium this patient will get? For one liter, patient should get 20 milli equivalent. So for five liter, five into 20 equal to 100 milli equivalent of potassium. So this will be your answer. Three liter normal saline, two liter dextrose, 100 milli equivalent of potassium. Clear everyone, any question? Potassium is usually given if like initially initially for a few days we can give it it's not a mandatory okay but yeah we can give it like the in the in the option you can see these patients they want to give the potassium all right we don't have any options without the potassium so we need to give some potassium to this patient the this is the usual maintenance treatment formula for any post-op patient now, some of the time we don't give potassium. That's true if potassium is normal. But for those patients who has a hemicolectomy, they, they tend to lose potassium because they have this stoma and from the stoma, they lose electrolyte very commonly. Yeah, first 24 hour, we don't give any potassium, but after that means in the second post-operative day, we can, we can start giving potassium. All right. So The formula will be every patient, every post-op patient should will get one liter normal saline plus two liter dextrose plus 20 milli equivalent potassium chloride for every liter of weight. So our patient having two liter deficient, that deficient amount, usually you have to give by normal saline. So add that two liter with this one liter. So it becomes three liter normal, two liter dextrose, and total now three liter plus two liter, which means five liter. For one liter, you are supposed to give 20 milli equivalent of potassium. For five liter, you will give five into 20, which is 100. All right, so how you can find out the deficit, right? Okay, so see that what is the input? Intravenous input means that you are giving IV fluid to this patient. That is your input. So input is two liter. Now you need to find out what is the output. So patient having output from the nasogastric tube, which is two liter, drain loss 700, urine output 500. So two liter plus seven plus 500, right and all the patients usually we take 500 ml for insensible loss so two liter plus 700 ml from drain 500 ml from urine output 
another 500 is insensible that will not be given we have to add it and if you do that what's the math it's roughly four liter always take it as a whole it will not be four liter if you add it but roughly four liter to like to make sure you can calculate it easily so you have output four liter input two liter so how much deficit four minus two which means two liter clear now so dr joe initially you don't give 60 milli equivalent you give 20 milli equivalent for every liter of fluid and joseph finn he usual so the usual thing is that potassium is given in second post operative day because in the first post operative day patient supposed to have some electrolyte abnormality because the body balance is disturbed so usually we don't need to give anything at that time but the, from the second post op day we can give it now it depends there are lots of operation uh, which might need potassium mainly intra abdominal operation where we give the stoma in that case but don't bother with those things because they will not give you like some option with potassium some option without potassium so obviously in here you can see all options are with potassium you just need to collect the amount of potassium you want to give so it becomes easier at that time yeah it's always two liter dextrose one liter normal saline that's the maintenance dose for every patient all good okay now let's take a five minute break before we go for other things because we are going to do some nerve related complicated questions later on and also we'll do some other questions so just make sure that you are your mind is free your brain is free take some drink or you can also take coffee tea that will help okay and then we'll start again so we'll see you in five minutes time thank you all
Okay, so let's start again. So this is the case in which we are going to learn about some nerve problem. So we'll do the upper limb neuropathies. So you, if you see this question, you can see there is a patient whose finger is dropped, right? So the left hand, you can see the finger is dropped, wrist is totally fine, and the right arm is also good. It's just the left arm finger dropping. You have got a patient who sustained a stab wound to the back of the left forearm in a pub brawl. He is trying to straighten his fingers on command. So you have asked the patient to straighten the finger. Patient is unable to do that. Which one of the following nerve is most likely to have injured? Radial nerve, median nerve, ulnar nerve, posterior interosseous nerve, and anterior interosseous nerve. Looking at the questions, it might seem a little bit of easier or difficult. If you do the handbook, it will be easier for you. But it's not like that. You need to know everything about a nerve. Sometimes questions can come in a different way also. So radial nerve anatomy is important to understand about these neuropathies. Your radial nerve, if you see, it starts from your brachial plexus and then at the axilla, from here, it passes through the spiral group of humerus and then turns from the back to the front, okay, and divide into two branches. One branch is called posterior interosseous nerve, another called superficial radial nerve. So we have got superficial radial nerve, which gives supply mainly sensory branches. And we have got posterior interosseous nerve as well. So this is the anatomy of radial nerve. Now, your radial nerve gives supply to the dorsal aspect of your hand. Okay, so if you see your radial nerve will give supply, that means a sensory supply to the thumb, index finger, and hub of the middle finger. Okay, so these three fingers will be given by the radial nerve and mainly the fourth and fifth finger will be given by the ulnar nerve. There's the dorsal surface. The palmar surface, the similar, the thumb, index and middle finger, this one will be given by median nerve and the fourth and fifth will be given by ulnar nerve. So in the palmar surface, Median nerve gives this supply, these three fingers, and in the dorsal surface, radial nerve gives the three finger supply. So radial nerve, this area, that means radial nerve usually helps with your extension of your wrist, extension of your finger. So all the extension is given by the radial nerve, whereas the flexion of your wrist flexion of your finger, these are given by mainly median nerve and ulnar nerve. All right, so let's move on. So the radial nerve can be injured in anywhere at its pathway. So it can be injured at the axilla, at the elbow, at the wrist. So anywhere it can be injured. So what are the findings we will get in different positions? If it is injured at the axilla, that means at the most upper portion of its journey, then what are the motor deficit will be there? So there will be loss of extension of the forearm and loss of extension of the hand, that means the wrist, and loss of extension of the finger. So loss of extension of the forearm, loss of extension of the wrist, and loss of extension of the finger. All this extension will be lost. And sensory deficit will be in your lateral part of the arm, also posterior part of the forearm, and those three and a half fingers. So if it is injured at the axilla, this posterior forearm, lateral arm, also sensory loss will be there. 
along with those three and a half fingers. Okay, you need to remember that, otherwise it will be difficult to differentiate. If it injured at the middle arm, that means fracture of the mid shaft of the humerus, which means if the fracture occurs in the mid shaft of the humerus in this area, how the patient will present to you. Everything will be same like in axilla, only difference will be in the sensory loss. In that case, the sensory loss will be only in the three and a half fingers but not in the posterior forearm or arm. That's the reason I say that in case of axillary injury, you will have this posterior forearm and lateral arm loss of sensation. Okay, that's how you can differentiate between these two. Next important is if it's injured just below the elbow. If it is injured just below the elbow, most of the time it injured the posterior interosseous nerve. So let's go to the picture again. So just below the elbow, like here, most of the time it injured this posterior interosseous nerve. The exceptional thing about posterior interosseous nerve is that it doesn't give any sensation to your arm, forearm or finger. It's just a completely motor nerve, which means it will just give your extension of the finger. So the posterior interosseous nerve, only motor function it does is the extension of your finger. So if it is injured just below the elbow, it will injure your posterior interosseous nerve and only finding you will get is the loss of extension of finger, which is the finger drop. There will be no loss of sensation, no problem with the wrist extension, okay? Just finger extension will be lost. If it is injured at the distal forearm, that means at, at or around the wrist, usually that occurs if anyone is stab you in the forearm. And in that case, patient usually injured their superficial branch of the radial nerve. And exceptional about that, that it is entirely sensory. So only sensory loss will be here. There will be no motor loss. And loss of sensation will be those three and a half finger only. So it's very easy if you understand it. So if we go to the picture, you will find it out. So if there is injury at the axillary region, patient will have loss of extension of the elbow, loss of, that means loss of extension of the forearm, loss of extension of the wrist, loss of extension of the finger. Then loss of sensation in the lateral part of the arm, posterior forearm, and these three and a half fingers. If it is injured at the mid shaft of the humerus, only change from the axillary injury will be this sensory loss. Sensory loss only will be these three and a half fingers no sensory loss in the forearm or arm. Then come to the below elbow injury. It usually injures posterior interosseous nerve, which is entirely motor. Only problem will be extension, loss of extension of the finger. And superficial branch of radial nerve, usually if anyone stab you at the forearm, that means at the distal part of the forearm, you injure the superficial radial nerve. It's entirely sensory, so you will only have loss of sensation in this three finger. Clear? So now if you look into this question, what do you think this patient is having? Which one of the following nerve is injured? Obviously you cannot choose only radial nerve because if it is radial nerve, then everything will be lost. Like loss of extension of the forearm, hand, fingers, everything. So more better option is posterior interosseous nerve because only problem in here is that patient is unable to straighten his fingers. Clear everyone?
Good. The next one is your lower limb neuropathy. Lower limb neuropathy, the most important lower limb neuropathy that happens is your L4, L5 nerve root issues and common perineal nerve issues. This two is the most important one. First of all, we'll go through this thing. First of all, what is common perineal nerve? Common perineal nerve is a branch of sciatic nerve. So mainly sciatic nerves come from your lumbosacral plexus, which is your L4, L5, S1, S2, S3. So from the lumbosacral plexus, sciatic nerve comes out and sciatic nerve later on becomes common perineal nerve. Common perineal nerve at the head of the fibula, you can see here, it turns to the forward part, that means at the anterior part of your knee, and it divides into two branches. One is superficial perineal nerve, another is deep perineal nerve. So again, sciatic nerve, see this, this is the sciatic nerve, followed by common perineal nerve, common perineal nerve divides into superficial perineal and deep perineal nerve. So normally from your thigh, sciatic nerve comes up and it divides into common perineal and tibial nerve. Common perineal nerve comes to the anterior part of your leg. Tibial nerve goes backwards. That means goes through your calf to the posterior part of your leg. Then common perineal nerve again divides into superficial and deep perineal nerve. Is this clear for everyone? Now, superficial perineal nerve gives supply to your whole anterior portion of your leg, except this area. That means in between first and second toe, this intertarsal space, Okay, this interdigital space, first interdigital space is supplied by the dorsal, sorry, deep perineal nerve. Other than this, all these are supplied by the superficial perineal nerve. So superficial perineal nerve gives supply to the anterior portion of your leg, dorsum of the foot, except the first interdigital space, which is given by deep perineal nerve. Now the motor function of common perineal nerve is important. Common perineal nerve, if you want to memorize it, then let me write it in here. For common perineal nerve, the function is ED. That means emergency department, which means eversion and dorsiflexion. eversion and dorsiflexion. This is the function of common perineal nerve, motor function. Now the deep perineal nerve, D for dorsi. So deep perineal nerve gives your dorsiflexion. Superficial perineal nerve gives your eversion. Dear everyone, so this is the main function of your common perineal nerve. Then the tibial nerve, which goes backwards, that means at the posterior part of your leg, tibial nerve helps with plantar flexion. Okay, so if there is problem with plantar flexion, that's mainly tibial nerve issue. Superficial perineal nerve will cause difficulty with eversion. Sciatic nerve will cause everything. That means if anyone has sciatic nerve problem, they cannot like, they will have problem with every movement of the ankle, eversion, inversion, dorsiflexion, everything will be having a problem. Now L4 nerve root, L5 nerve root. L4 nerve root, so this is the 
this is the medial portion of your leg, right? This part, and this is the lateral part. Your medial portion of the leg is given by L4. Lateral part is given by L5. L4 nerve root, mainly L3 and L4. L3 is mainly around the knee in this area. L3, L4 give your knee jerk, but L5 doesn't have any reflex. Whereas S1, S2 gives your ankle jerk. Okay, so L5 nerve root problem, you will not have any problem with your reflex. And if it's L5 nerve root problem, the problem will be in the lateral part of your leg. And L5 nerve root problem also causes problem with dorsiflexion, inversion, and eversion. So if you have problem with L5, you have problem with dorsiflexion, inversion, eversion, which means die. Any patient having difficulty with dorsiflexion of the ankle, they have this foot drop because if you cannot elevate the ankle, then your foot will drop. That's your dorsiflexion causing foot drop. Now come to the question. 64 year old women complaining of dragging her right foot. Dragging right foot means foot drop, right? And numbness, paresthesia in that leg. On examination, there is foot drop, weakness of dorsiflexion, inversion and eversion of the ankle. So D-I-E, that means die. Reflex are normal. Loss of sensation on the outer side of the lower leg. Outer side of the lower leg is the lateral side, which means it's the L5 nerve root. Reflex normal. You have got your motor function. So which of the following nerve root is most likely cause of her presentation? L5 nerve root. See how easy it is? If you know, know these formulas, it becomes so easy. Otherwise, if you want to memorize, then it will be lot and lot and lot and harder. Okay? So always remember these sort of important clues during the exam, otherwise it becomes harder. Okay, so that is your lower limb neuropathy. That This one is the most important neuropathy that can come in your exam. And in your upper limb, we discuss the radial nerve. In one of the other class, we'll discuss the ulnar nerve, median nerve. Okay, those are also important. Now, the another important topic is pneumothorax. Pneumothorax, there is a lot of confusion. I also see that sometimes in our group, many of you upload questions. And most of the time I see that pneumothorax questions, most of you are like, you're, you're, you're choosing options which are absolutely wrong. So after today's class, you should not have any problem with the pneumothorax at least. So we have got a patient who has 15% pneumothorax and a history of asthma. Just use salbutamol when has upper respiratory tract infection. Saturation is 95%, what to do? Aspirate, chest x-ray after 24 hours, chest drain, oxygen, admit and observe. Now, first of all, we'll go through this thing and then we'll decide. Pneumothorax means when a patient has air in their pleural cavity. And that excessive air can compress the lung, causing difficulty breathing, causing chest pain and hypoxia or lack of oxygenation. Now, pneumothorax mainly divided into primary pneumothorax, secondary pneumothorax. Primary pneumothorax means when there is no underlying cause. If there is any underlying cause, like if a patient has asthma, COPD, bronchic tesis, 
and that patient gets pneumothorax that is called secondary pneumothorax. Primary spontaneous pneumothorax can happen if there is like rupture of bulla or blebs on the surface of the lung. Now, primary spontaneous pneumothorax, you need to divide into small or large if the patient has symptoms or no symptoms. Depending on that, we will treat those patients. So for primary spontaneous pneumothorax, we say it's a small pneumothorax if the size of the pneumothorax is less than 15%. This is one of the confusion you guys have because in your GM it's written 25%, in your handbook it's written 15%. But we will take 15% because in your handbook is very clearly, clearly written everything about the management of pneumothorax. So if it is a small pneumothorax, that means less than 15% or less than two centimeter with minimal symptoms, that means patient doesn't have severe chest pain or shortness of breath, just patient did a chest X-ray and you find out a pneumothorax, which is very small. In that situation, you will just do observation. So admit and observe. And then patient can have later on also can go home if everything is okay. So for a small pneumothorax, minimal symptom, management is observation. For large but minimal symptom, that means more than 15% pneumothorax, but there is no symptom. If no symptom, no need of any active treatment, you can give oxygen because oxygen helps to reabsorb those air that collected in your pleural cavity. So you can give oxygen or you can also, after giving oxygen, you should admit and observe the patient for at least 24 hours. Now, the main thing is the middle one, larger or small, whatever it is, if a patient has significant symptom, that means severe chest pain, hypoxia, shortness of breath, that patient needs catheter aspiration or needle aspiration immediately. So you do a catheter aspiration or needle aspiration, that's the main management. Remember previously we used to do aspiration only in tension pneumothorax, right? But that's not the case, very well written in the handbook. So you will start with aspiration. If aspiration doesn't help or manage the symptoms, then only you go for chest drain. Some of the other options when we go for chest drain is this one. So after catheter aspiration, Consider chest drain if, if you aspirate more than three liter air, repeat chest x-ray after two to four hours of aspiration shows more than 15% pneumothorax or significant symptoms. In these two situation, you have to do the chest drain. More than three liter aspiration came up or after two to four hours, you again repeat the chest x-ray, but it still is more than 15% pneumothorax or patient having significant symptoms. So that's your primary pneumothorax management. Clear? For secondary pneumothorax, you have to see if this patient having any symptoms, mainly any shortness of breath, or A is more than 50, or if the rim of air in chest X-ray more than two centimeter or pneumothorax more than 15%, any of it, like patient having symptom, pneumothorax more than 15%, A is more than 50, all those patients should have a chest drain initially, not aspiration. For secondary pneumothorax, main management is chest drain, not improved, Usually, like, usually if you give chest drain, patient should improve. But sometimes if the pneumothorax is very small, like less than 15%, patient doesn't have any symptom, A is less than 50, then you can try aspiration. 
If aspiration doesn't help, then you go for chest drain. Okay. Now come to the question. 15 percent pneumothorax, young person asthma. It's a primary or secondary pneumothorax. Secondary pneumothorax because patient has asthma, right? For secondary pneumothorax, if it is 15 percent pneumothorax, what and also patient having hypoxia, like saturation 95 percent, not that much hypoxia, but yeah. In this situation, what do you want to do? You want to do aspiration. You want to do chest X-ray after 24 hours, chest drain, oxygen, admit and observe. As it's a secondary pneumothorax and 15%, which means minimal, uh, marginal, right? In this situation, we will go for chest drain. Same patient without any lung condition, what would be the management? Yeah, we can now remember they have given you saturation. If saturation is more than 94%, you don't need to give oxygen. Only if it is less than 94, then you can give oxygen. Or even if oxygen saturation was not given, then according to that chart, we could start oxygen because it's marginal. It will fall under this, this one. That means large and minimal symptom. But as oxygen saturation is given in the question and it's more than 94, you can just admit and observe at that time. Okay. Now, the only complication or confusion ha happens because in your gem it said if it is more than 25% pneumothorax, you have to insert chest drain if patient has symptom or not. Now, if that is the case in the exam, just because it's in the gym, choose chest drain if it is more than 25%. This is a little bit confusing, but there is no such guideline that we can follow actually. So in that situation, if 25% is given in the exam, then choose chest drain because it's written in the JM. Otherwise, follow everything that I have written and I have taught you. Next question. You have got a patient with UTI, started with broad spectrum antibiotic, at first, she was not well, and in the meantime, urine microscopic culture came positive for Klebsiella with antibiogram. Antibiogram is the sensitivity that this bug is sensitive to what, what antibiotics, Klebsiella antibiogram. But the patient is getting well with the previous antibiotic. What do you want to do? Continue the same antibiotic, change according to antibiogram, repeat urine MCS, Consult with ID specialist. That means infectious disease specialist. What do you want to do? You want to continue the antibiotic because patient is feeling better or you want to choose the antibiotic which is sensitive to, to this bug. Remember one thing, this sensitivity is done to find out the exact antibiotic for that particular organism. Even if patient feels better, sometimes that can be just a like initial response to any antibiotic. But you will always, always choose the appropriate antibiotic when the sensitivity comes back. Okay? That will help with many things like, re now you are giving a broad spectrum antibiotic. And when you choose it according to antibiogram, it becomes a narrow spectrum. And it helps to remove resistance to the other antibiotics. Everything is 
important okay so you need to go for always nt biogram you have to choose in that way not just patient is feeling feeling well in you don't follow just patient feeling well or not you have to go for the sensitivity next one resident doctor took consent from patient to take picture from his wound patient gives consent what can he do with the picture so let us assume you are a resident doctor in a hospital you took consent from a patient that you want to take picture for his own patient gave the consent now how you will use that picture that's the question can you share it with your colleague use it for assessment of the patient share it in a group share it with your cons with his consultant for treatment purpose without further consent share it in medical journal for academic purpose remember one thing you can only use it for assessment of patient now if you want to consult with your senior doctor and you want to share this picture with them you have to take consent from the patient that this is why you have taken the consent this is why you are taking the picture that you want to talk with the consultant okay that's very important to remember this will be our most likely today's last class last session oh we have some other question good no there are three or four questions left okay next one a lady who had a colectomy one year ago now has bmi 15 is admitted but he complains why she is admitted by her surgeon she wants to go to her gp to understand her problem better what is the diagnosis so you have got a patient who had a colectomy one year ago bmi 15 she is complaining why she is admitted by her surgeon why not her gp who understand her problem better is it depression borderline personality disorder anorexia nervosa major depressive disorder kind of incomplete scenario to me but still looking at the question it seems like it's a it's a kind of a splitting i would say like this patient doesn't want to be treated by the surgeon but wants to be treated by the gp okay yes kind of a splitting situation going on which is a very important characteristic of borderline personality disorder looking at the bmi i cannot choose anorexia nervosa because this patient had a colectomy that colectomy can also contribute to this bmi okay so better to choose borderline personality disorder but obviously look at the full scenario if they add something else we have to think otherwise because it's not completely splitting because splitting means all good all bad in here just two person patient is differentiating gp and the surgeon not completely splitting but the other options doesn't seem good to me so borderline personality disorder is a is a disorder in which a person has recurrent suicidal attempt they have like irritable mood mood swings they have problem with relationships so multiple breakup okay they have they are emotional and then also this patient show a characteristic defense mechanism which is splitting that means they think of, like either a patient or group of people is good or bad no middle all right so they they divide all the people into two group bad or good so that's splitting next one a patient who was taking ssri having gi symptoms what can we do now so now this question we discussed this question in our psychiatry class if i remember so dr matthew 
the treatment of borderline personality disorder is dialectical behavioral therapy that's the main treatment so remember we discussed this one if any patient having abdominal problem with gi with ssri we just switch to another ssri now dialectical behavioral therapy is a subtype of cbt but it's more directed to the borderline personality disorder because this sort of patient had suicidal behavior and in dialectical behavioral therapy you want to put or insert some positive thoughts in her mind and make her like less susceptible to harm herself okay but the exact name of the treatment is the dialectical behavioral therapy which is more directed to this sort of uh, harm or suicidal risk if dr asha if sexual difficulty then you reduce the dose you don't change to another ssri you can reduce the dose or also you can add another you can change to snri but in, before changing we try to reduce the dose in sexual difficulty aboriginal girl after fall developed pain and swelling of her ankle no murmur fever positive and recent pharyngitis history that's one of the very important clue recent pharyngitis means recent sore throat and the, now the patient is a aboriginal that's another clue and now also patient having joint pain right ankle joint pain and swelling with fever what is this condition rheumatic fever very good so rheumatic fever usually happens like there is some criteria rheumatic fever follows so patient usually will give you a history of sore throat by group a beta streptococcus organism that mainly causes pharyngitis followed by they will start having those criteria symptoms the criteria has major and minor criteria major criteria is polyarthritis which is most of the time migratory polyarthritis that means in this patient what will happen ankle joint will be involved then it will get better then it comes to the knee joint then the hip joint elbow joint like the joint pain moves which is migratory polyarthritis also those patient have cardiac involvement so carditis they have subcutaneous nodules they have a particular rash called erythema marginatum which means that the margin will be red and there will be central pallor and there is a kind of involuntary movement they do which we call sydenham chorea so mainly the patient usually presents with either erythema marginatum subcutaneous nodule or joint involvement because chorea myocarditis these are not very commonly found then you have minor criteria minor criteria fever one thing arthralgia crp will be elevated esr will be elevated if you do a ecg you will get prolonged pr interval which is first degree heart block you can get leukocytosis as well to diagnose rheumatic fever you need either two major criteria or one major two minor criteria with that you need a evidence of a streptococcal infection so you can take throat swab you can do entry streptolysin o titer which means aso titer so anything you will have to do so this is your rheumatic fever so in our patient you have got pain and swelling of her ankle okay you have got fever
So you most likely you have got one arthritis or arthralgia, which is one major criteria. You have got fever, which is one minor criteria. You need another minor criteria to diagnose it. So if you get C ESR elevated or CBC shows leukocytosis, then it becomes two minor criteria, one major criteria, and you got recent pharyngitis history. Okay, now, and I don't know what serology they actually said. If they want you to choose that, they will obviously give a part, like a definitive language, which means they would write ASO title. But serology, it's a kind of vague. We don't know what type of serology they are doing in here. So don't choose any vague options. The last question for today, child had a recent fall, now febrile with marked focal tenderness on the medial upper tibia. So you have got a child had a fall, febrile, focal tenderness on the tibia, soft systolic murmur, bruises. What is the diagnosis? Stomyelitis, septic arthritis, endocarditis, rheumatic fever. No, even if ASO titer would be there, we could not choose that because patient doesn't fulfill the criteria. So we need two minor, one major. So at least you have to fulfill the criteria first and then the evidence of a streptococcal infection will come up. Now, any child come to you with fever and tenderness in the bone, we need to rule out septic arthritis or osteomyelitis. How to differentiate between these two? If a child shows point tenderness or focal tenderness, that's the main clue for osteomyelitis. In septic arthritis, it will be like a, yes, the joint tenderness and it will be a diffuse tenderness, not a focal tenderness. And this soft systolic murmur, it's an innocent murmur, right? It, it doesn't have to do anything with this thing and bruise mainly due to fall. So if you see this one, This is from your RCH guideline. Osteomyelitis, patient has localized pain and pain on movement. This is, we call this as a point tenderness or focal tenderness. That's very, very good clue for osteomyelitis. Septic arthritis, patient will have no focal tenderness is a generalized tenderness of the bone or joint. Clear? So in that case, we will choose osteomyelitis in the here. Clear everyone? So that was our today's session. I hope the session was very helpful for you. And then you guys know that your two weeks free session is coming up from 31st of October. So don't miss this opportunity. And if you guys want to book your seat because our seats are limited for the next batch. If you want to book your seat, obviously try to contact with us with the email or in the messenger so that we can book your seat for the next batch. Thank you, Dr. Manal. Okay, so...
So doctor, can I know your name? Uh, your name showing as MS. What's your full name, doctor? Dr. Mehek, all right. So Dr. Mehek, so you've got a child and had a viral infection before, went for an operation under GA, got bronchospasm and hypotension. So intraoperative hypotension and bronchospasm. Most likely bronchospasm hypotension is a anesthetic allergic reaction. Most likely reason latex, iodine, tape, isoflurane. I would choose isoflurane because we use this in our general anesthesia. No, low back pain with tenderness in the back is not an indication of X-ray. We'll do that low back pain case sometime, but no, it's not the absolute and absolute indication. But if you have cervical tenderness, then you have to do a CT scan. But for low back, it's if there is tender, it deep, sometimes vertebral dysfunction patient can have tenderness also. Okay, it depends on how the question comes. Dr. Aisha, now in case of obscure GI bleeding, so if you get a, like a patient with obscure GI bleeding, first thing you need to see that if it's the elderly patient. If it's the elderly patient, obviously you have to do a coronoscopy. Now, sometimes coronoscopy may not be able to pass through the hepatic flexor or the splenic flexor. They can give it to the exam that Chronoscopy or sigmoidoscopy tube is not passing through the splenic flexor. Next thing you do for this sort of cases is to do a CT coronography. Now, even if the CT coronography doesn't give you any idea, still patient have persistent bleeding or anemia, last option will be doing a capsule endoscopy. I've seen many of you are choosing capsule endoscopy before CT coronography. No, CT coronography will be the Next after colonoscopy, last will be capsule endoscopy. Dr. Ridima, we discussed that question in our class. You are in our course, right? So you should know that this, this question we discussed in our theory, uh, in our uh, gynec class, I think, gynec question class. What do you mean by interventional CT scan, Dr. Aisha? Yes, it should be endometrial thickness because it's a 45 year old and CIN2, okay? We want to, now obviously you see had been treated for CIN2 previously and the last PEP was normal six months ago. Obviously we are not thinking about cervical cancer. So you don't need to do a pap smear, endometrial cure test, colposcopy, no, no need. So you, it's a 45 year old, you need to do a ultrasound to see the endometrial thickness. Most of the time, this sort of patient has dysfunctional uterine bleeding. The better option is hysteroscopy and DNC, if that would be in the option. But before you go for that, do an ultrasound first.
Now this angiography you have mentioned, Dr. Aisha, it's usually done like if you suspect anyone having any angiodysplasia, okay, that angiodysplasia, Meckel's diverticulum, sometimes those sort of things can cause bleeding. Only at that time we can do the angiography, but it's not anything like first line or second line or third line. Yeah, Aboriginal men should go through motivational therapy. All right, guys, so we'll stop here tonight. We'll discuss the October questions and also the August questions in our coming classes, not today. All right, so thank you so much for your participation. And then obviously we'll, we'll meet in the next class on 31st October. All right, keep in touch and also try to study harder. Thank you all, have a good night, bye.